members won't know this and there's no reason they should. The words democratic development were added by amendment to the center's title in the Senate, not to balance in any way human rights against democracy, but to make it clear that the emphasis on rights is precisely what is involved in democratic development. I want now to emphasize the importance of rights and democracy's reputation for complete independence from the government of the day, an independence that has now been shattered, I believe. Mr. Mulroney and Mr. Chrétien and their foreign ministers understood this very well. They re revealed this understanding in two ways. First, by appointing people to the board without a partisan agenda. As we all know, a government can impose a partisan agenda simply by making carefully selected appointments without any need for explicitly partisan instructions going to the appointees. The previous prime ministers carefully avoided doing this with rights and democracy. Secondly, they expected rights and democracy at times to be in open disagreement with them on international human rights issues. Third, if I may say so, they appointed as presidents people they believed would act in this independent manner. As president of rights and democracy, I openly advocated the inclusion of workers' rights clauses as outlined in the covenant in economic and social and cultural rights in all international trade agreements and the speedy adoption of an international covenant on rights of indigenous peoples. Whether in substance or emphasis, such positions, and on a few other matters, were at variance with the government of the day. At no time did I receive criticism from the prime minister or foreign minister. Indeed, during the 1990s, our activist work on the ground in many developing nations I and my staff were frequently facilitated in our work by those fine public servants working on human rights issues in our embassies abroad. In my view, it was because of rights and democracy's reputation for knowledge and independence of the government of the day that when I requested a meeting with President Clinton in the White House or asked for a meeting with the King of Thailand or the presidents of Guatemala, Mexico, Rwanda, or Eritrea, and Kenya, among others, these requests were granted and the meetings took place. The day rights and democracy becomes known not for its independence on rights matters from the government of the day, but for supine acquiescence to the party political agendas of the day will be, will be the day that foreign governments and NGOs alike will cease to be interested in the opinions of rights and democracy. If they want the Canadian government's view, they will simply call in the Canadian ambassador. Now something about the roles of the chair and the president. According to the act, the prime purpose of the chair is to preside over meetings of the board as well as to take on other particular duties as might be assigned to him or her. The president, as its chief executive officer, quote, has supervision over and direction of the work and staff of the center, end of quote. In plain language, the chair of the board is not the CEO of the organization. It's the president who has and exercises the power of the CEO. When the board of the center makes its decision on broad policy directions and major grants, it is then up to the president and his responsibility for the day-to-day -day operations of the center to hire and supervise the staff and to make other decisions required to implement those objectives. The staff, notably the management team, are responsible to him and to no one else. Neither the chair nor any other member of the board has a right to impinge or encroach upon the president's authority to deal directly with the staff. Early in 2009, when Mr. Brown became chair of the board, he came to an organization in a very good state of morale. With, within the previous year, it had not only received an excellent annual report on efficiency from the Auditor General, but in addition passed with commendation the five-year review conducted by the Department of Foreign Affairs. 
Its recent program and women's rights in, Afga in Afghanistan have been singled out for praise by CEDA. In short, it's a matter of public record, not opinion, that under Mr. Beauregard's presidency, the management and staff were operating efficiently, transparently, and responsibly. In contrast, after the arrival of Mr. Brown as chairman, to use the words he wrongly applied to the staff, it is the board itself that has become dysfunctional, has embraced a culture of dogmatism, and finally lacks transparency. I would add that it has also been since the arrival of Mr. Braun that the Board of Rights and Democracy has lost two of its distinguished foreign members, one by resignation and the other failing to get reappointment, has been criticized by the International Federation of Human Rights, was criticized by William Chavis, the distinguished Canadian head of the Irish Human Rights Centre, and to complete the ignominious list, has had its judgments contradicted for the first time ever by Human Rights Watch and Amnesty International. In responding to questions about these matters, I will be very happy to elaborate. In the course of all these developments, and following the tragic death of the President, Mr. Brown is probably the first chair of a public institution in Canadian history to have inherited a highly praised management team, as well as an exceptionally educated and dedicated staff, and then by extraordinary mismanagement, united them in virtual uni unanimity in a vote demanding his resignation. If ever there was a cause for the dismissal of a public appointee on the grounds of gross incompetence, this is it. And I hope this committee will recommend it. I have never, to my knowledge, ever before called for the public dismissal of a public official. I am doing so today. And if I may, on a personal note, I'd like to conclude by saying something about a key, me key member of the management team who has been singled out for particular criticism by some members of the board. Marie-France Cloutier has worked over 19 years for the Centre, the first six for me in a senior position throughout my term as President. In all my years of public life, I never met a more competent or more loyal subordinate. She was a loyal employee, but she never hesitated to speak truth to power. That such a fine person and public servant was so arbitrarily dismissed says more about those who now run the center than it does about her. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, thank you, Mr. Broadman. We're now going to move over to Mr. Allman for 10 minutes. <clears throat> Uh, Mr. Chair, members of the committee, I want to first thank you for the opportunity to appear before you today respecting this important issue. As you know, I served as President of Rights and Democracy from 1997 to 2002, and uh, furthermore, I was a Member of Parliament in 1988 when the uh, Centre was established by an Act of Parliament. Today I want to speak about the mandate of the Centre, its independence, how that independence was exercised during my mandate, its accountability and transparency, and the relationship between the President and the Board, and the relationship between the Centre and the Government. I will also comment on how much of this has changed since March 2009 with the appointment of several directors, including Oral Braun, as the Chair of the Board. The mandate of the Centre is set out in Section 4 of the law. In a nutshell, it is to defend and promote democracy and human rights, and in particular, those rights set out in the International Bill of Human Rights. In other words, the governing, the governing imperative for the Centre is the International uh, Bill of Human Rights. The governing imperative is not the foreign policy of Canada. It is not the foreign policy of the United States, and it's certainly not the foreign policy of Israel. And the Centre is directed by law to be totally independent in pursuing that mandate, in pursuing that governance imperative. Rights and democracy, therefore, carries the flag of human rights, 
It doesn't carry the flag of Canada, the United States.